Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session called Data Strategy, Creating a Breakthrough Insight Organization in a Data-Rich World, which will be presented by Jason Perkins, the head of Data and Analytics Architecture at BT. Just a note, due to a conflict, this session has been pre-recorded. All audience members are muted during these sessions. Though the speaker is unable to attend, please do feel free to submit questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen to be reviewed at a later time. Please note that there is a link form at the bottom of the page for sessions survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome. Hi there, and welcome to Enterprise Data World. Um, my name is Jason Perkins, and I'm the head of data and analytics at uh, BT, the largest uh, fixed and mobile digital uh, communication provider in the UK. I'm here today to talk to you about creating a breakthrough insight organization in a data rich world. So, no matter where we are today, whether we're at home, whether we're in the office, whether we're at the shops, whether we're out with friends, um, whether we're out in the great countryside, um, out seeing our world, you know, we're connected everywhere we are today. Um, and really the pandemic's brought that home as, you know, the importance of being connected and why it's fundamental to the way we live our lives today. I, I see that in my teenage boys, you know, it, it is up there um, in the uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, next to, uh, you know, water, air, you know, connectivity. Um, it is all important, whether it's uh, fixed, whether it's mobile, whether it's Wi-Fi, that they want to be connected all the time. Um, and this is a this is a trend that's uh, just continuing to exponentially grow. You know, today on average, you know, you know, ten devices roughly in the average home in um, in the UK and Europe. But we know we're predicting over the next five years that you know that's going to grow to two hundred uh, devices in the average home. You know, a, a real massive growth. Um, and that trend will just continue as increasingly more and more devices um, become smarter uh, and connected. Um, and really what that brings is, you know, a wealth of data to us to help us actually understand what's happening in this world. You know, a real digitization uh, of the real world, you know, and that, that will help us, you know, deliver brilliant experiences um, for our customers and our colleagues. However, that does require that we think somewhat differently about how we treat that data in this data-rich world. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you more about today. So, you know, in order to, you know, really unlock the, uh, the insight from, from all this data and all these connected devices, we really need to, you know, connect the dots. You know, what you can see in this diagram is, you know, we're seeing an explosion in the number of channels um, at the top there, you know, so you've got the physical channels, so your retail stores, um, you know, your, your account, uh, managers um, uh, and your pop-up um, areas, uh, you know, your tr traditional uh, brick and mortar stores. Um, you've got then, you know, um, also your online stores, so your, so your websites, your, your affiliate, your partners. Um, and increasingly we're seeing also, you know, through through social as well, you know, so, um, you know, um, your Facebooks, your LinkedIn's, um, your, um, you know, a, just a richness in terms of the number of uh, different channels you can actually um, engage with organizations on today um, you know and fundamentally you know we want to connect across all there so we're able to provide you know, so you're able to provide relevant conversations with your customers and relevant experiences um, across those those better channels you know and, and then we've got in the middle here we've got you know the different types you know so you've got your your business to consumer type relationship so whether that's an individual or, or a, um, a family or a household um, into your your a B2B market, whether that's uh, a man in a van um, or, uh, you know, a mom and pop store um, through to your um, corporate, your public um, services. So your, your big uh, multinational banks and, um, uh, and other organizations, uh, you know, your uh, consumer packaged goods, uh, international organizations um, through to your wholesalers uh, and then up into your multinational uh, companies. So, you know, we we operate in over 180 countries around the world trying to connect for our major customers um, a seamless experience. And then we've got the, you know, the different connections we have as well. You know, so, you know, what we're seeing, uh, you know, a real 
um, transformation in the type of traffic that we're bringing over these connected networks these days. You know, um, I remember back in the day when it was all about counting minutes and it was, you know, about voice. Uh, and the more people were speaking on the phone, then, you know, uh, you know, experience was great. Uh, revenue uh, grew, it, you know, it was uh, quite simple times. It didn't seem like at the time, but, you know, today where you've got a wealth of different types of data, you know, data makes up over 85% of the traffic on the networks these days, and that that percentage keeps growing year on year. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing there is, you know, you've got your, uh, your media, so, you know, lots of people consuming um, on-demand uh, TV and series binge-watching. Uh, um, being, you know, one of the great change in the, the sort of TV habits uh, during my uh, lifetime, um, um, as well as, you know, the connected, the, the, the mobility, so you're connected anywhere, um, whether um, the gaming, you know, whether that's mobile or, or again, uh, more households, um, through to the different connected devices we're seeing. So, the, the you know, the great, you know, the, the, coming, the coming growth of uh, Internet of Things, so whether that's, you know, connected, um, uh, your drones or your connected toothbrush, uh, you know, your connected um, uh, uh, multimedia systems. I've got a smart TV. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, a massive growth in those sort of areas. Uh, and then, you know, also into the business markets where we're seeing you know, smart buildings, um, smart data centers, um, smart um, shopping uh, malls. You know, we're seeing digitization of, uh, of pretty much everything. And, you know, what we're trying to do here is connect all these different um these devices and these channels uh, and, and these customers to really understand what's going on here, trying to create that digital twin of the physical world so we can really optimize it and, and actually provide experiences to our customers and to our colleagues that, that really build on that. And, and that's one of the real challenges when we think about scale. You know, we've talked about the growth in the number of connected devices. Um, we've also got a massive growth in the amount of data being carried over these networks. So, you know, time seven growth over the next two to three years, of the, you know, that's what we're predicting across, uh, you know, fixed mobile and Wi-Fi. Um, and we can take some, you know, we're, what we're looking for is inspiration around how, you know, what sort of patterns work. And there we can actually look to the real world. You know, how is the real world managing these complex adaptive systems? So we can look at nature. Uh, you know, so, you, you know, you look at your um, um, uh, organic ecosystems, so, you know, the animal kingdom, whether it's nature with, you know, the great forests of the world, you know, there's real, you know, patterns there around how, they, how the world's managed to scale that, um, as well as cities, one of the great innovators of the innovations of the last 200 years, you know, uh, you know, how pe uh, people have come together and produced more value by coming into the great cities. Um, we also got the social platforms of the last 20 years, you know, where, you know, that's really creating new digital connections for people. So people can, you know, have bigger networks of people they connect to than they could in the physical world. And then you've got your organizations, you know, how organized, you know, that continues to evolve, um, you know, over the last 200 years. Um, you know, organizations, you know, again, how do they scale organizations? And as well as the communication industry, you know, how do we manage complex networks and that manage that growth, um, both the growth and the scale. And, you know, well, why is that important? Well, what we see is, you know, there's certain laws and those laws have certain properties and those properties can be quite useful if we think about them in a, in a data rich world. You know, so if you look at the physical world, you look at, um, you know, cities, what we can see is that, you know, wealth creation, crime, innovation, actually super scale in cities you know that's why cities have been a great growth engine for us you know so the more people we've got you know the the more create um, wealth they create so it's not a linear scale of one for one it's actually above one you know um uh, wealth creation um, innovation truly scales in these mega cities you know and that's why we're seeing cities continue to grow obviously there's some downsides to that we also need to think about like crime that tends to also super scale and clearly that's not you know not a desirable property uh, pollution is also another thing you need to look at you know so that, you know we need to look at these and think yeah how, how, what can we do to manage these scales when we look at nature what we see is actually you know animals we share a lot of common properties so you know roughly in the animal world you know 1.5 billion heartbeats in a lifetime of an animal doesn't matter whether you're a whale or you're a shrew. It's you know roughly roughly even. You know the bigger the animal, the slower the heart beats. Um, typically have a longer life span. Smaller animals typically have a much shorter um, 
for lifespans, but their heart beats much, much quicker. You know, there's clearly some universal laws that are regulating this. Um, humans probably being, you know, we're the one lucky species who's managed to de defy in the, only in the last hundred years, this sort of rule, uh, we've managed to extend our life beyond uh, what was true for the previous thousands of years. Um, also, we've seen in social networks that how news uh, can scale, especially in there's a lot of talk about fake news at the moment, uh, and you know how that scales. You know, again, we can see that super scales often. You know that, um, especially the more uh, um, uh, the you know the more tantalising it is, tends to tends to get around. You know, again, we can look at that. You know, not that we want to promote that. You know, fake news, but more it's more interesting in the pattern and how how is that actually scaling? How is how is that spreading across a network? Uh, and then we also look at urbanization, you know, um, per capita as it grows. So what, what we see here is, um, yeah, you know, um, you know, this, this is, you know, these are, these are where we're scaling more, uh, more linearly. So what we see is actually a much more, actually subscale is actually lower than linear. So that's a, instead of one for one, it's below one. So for every one person you add, actually it gets more efficient. So we're more energy efficient, for example, in the big cities than we are if we're actually out um, spread out more uh, more across an area. You know, there's some efficiency that comes to this. That's the columns of scale type rules. Again, very interesting when we think about data networks, you know, how how do we unlock all that connected data in our organizations? Um, and, you know, there's some great writers on this. Um, Phil, Philip Tetlow, I can certainly call him out. Also, Jeffrey West has written, written a brilliant book on scale. Uh, and, you know, they talk about, you know, um, and as well as, some greats of power of networks, another great book around this sort of topic. Um, and what, what we see here is there's real universal laws. And I'll call out three of the big ones here. One is, you know, in terms of these complex data systems, you need to think about how you space fill. How do you cover the entire ecosystem? You know, that's a fundamental, uh, and we'll talk about what that means with data analytics in a second. We also need to think about terminal units. So typically what we see is they're largely identical. So whether that's buildings, which have you know similar plug sockets all over the building, how do you scale that? You know by having it identical, um, as well as in nature. You know if you look at capillaries, you know largely similar across all animals. Um, and then also what we see in these large adaptive systems is they're self-optimizing. They evolve. They adapt. You know some important principles there for us to consider. So let, let's just think about that. From you know what does that mean for our data and analytics organization and our architecture and our strategy? Well, when we think about space filling, you know, that's where what we truly mean by democratizing. You know, we need to fill the whole of the organization with data and insight. You know, and that's from the C-suite all the way to the front line and beyond. You know, in these extended organizations, ecosystems, what we're seeing is partners out into your partners, out into your customers. You need to really unlock it. So it's not about decentralization or centralization. It's about redistributing that across the whole organization. And, and how and what some other patterns to do that? Well, this terminal units idea is quite powerful because what we can think about there is actually if we have common ways of doing this, then it's much easier to democratize this across across an organization. So so common data platforms and common services that people can engage with, whether that's APIs, whether that's um, AI algorithms, whether that's um, data visualization tooling, whether that's data engineering tooling. You know, common ways of doing that allows us much easier to connect those pipes to connect that insight across an organization and really give you the cumulative effects. You know, that's where you're building up the cumulative effect and these network effects of, of connecting all these things together. So one and one doesn't equal two, it equals three, four, five. And then also we're thinking, you know, how do we optimize this system that we're producing with all this data in it? Now, how do we do that? Well, you know, self-optimizing, what we need to, you know, is about experimentation here. This is what we want to take um, and a test to learn approach so we can actually evolve the system based on insights. You know, so uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. But, yeah, generally, we want to drive lots of experimentation across the whole organization as well. So lots of experiments and test and learning. Not everything will work. We need to learn, we've got to test and learn as that stuff, as we prove that, that actually there is evidence that this is heading in the right direction. I'm an architect, so we, we have to cover a bit of architecture. So let me uh, go into that now. So when we talk about data strategy, you know, there's a number of pillars to data strategy. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on today is really the, the, the middle pillars here around architecture as an architect and the roadmap. 
And I will also touch on, I'll touch on some of the other pillars, but you know, in, in 40 minutes, I'd rather dive into one of the pillars than give a, a broad brush view across the different pillars. But you know, what, what I guess I'm saying here is architecture is fundamental to a data strategy, but there are other pillars you need to consider to really truly be, if you want to build that data rich organization. Um, that, that we talked about at the start there. You know, so you need to think about your vision and principles to so that everyone's on the same page. You need to think about what the business outcomes you want to deliver um, that, um, across the whole organization. You need to think about how you manage your assets, those shared assets across the organization. What, what are the most valuable assets in your organization and how are you going to unlock them across your organization? How are you going to unlock the actual skills? How are you going to increasingly make data part of everyone's job in your, as part of your data culture? And then also think about the ways the ways you work, how how you govern it, how what your operating, what your fundamental um, your funding approaches are to this. So all important things. And uh, as we said, you know, self optimizing your strategy needs to be tested and adjusted. It's not a one and done thing. It's very much an evolutionary thing. And you should prove that through these lighthouse cases um, that that actually evolve um, as you go through your journey. So. Here's um, a data analytics reference architecture. Um, so, you know, in terms of the data and reference architecture, then I like to think of it as there's two major steps. One is you have to provide the right foundations. You know, so we'll start at the bottom. You know, we need to build the right foundations. Um, so we'll start at the bottom. A data, so, you know, a data marketplace. You know, if you're truly going to be an insight-driven company, you need to manage and govern and assure your data assets. So you need to know what data assets you've got. You need to manage it as an asset, manage it like you manage your, your capital, manage it like you manage your people um, or your assets, um, your other assets, your physical assets. You know, that's the way we need to manage data. And hence, that's why we've got the pillar on the right um, in the gray here, enterprise information management. You know, these are all the common capabilities you need. You know, and this is fundamental to the whole strategy is you need to know what data you've got, what's it being used for, where it's being used. You know, these are, these are the fundamentals. Also, you need to democratize this information. It isn't a centralization. It needs to be adaptive. It needs to be democratized so that people can understand. So we can. So this is where the marketplace idea comes in. We need to treat it like a marketplace so people can, you know, so we can get the wisdom of crowds. We can crowdsource this information so that people can find, they can understand, and they can collaborate around our data. You know, so that's the fundamental first pillar in our enterprise data foundation. The second one is really we need a data fabric. So, you know, we need to be able to unlock and mobilize our data, you know? So, um, you know, and that requires a rich um, array. You know, we focus on an event-based architecture because what we see as uh, in this growth in connectivity is a ma massive, you know, the massive growth, the exponential growth is in event-based data. So that's those connected devices. It's you know it's data, and that data needs to be streamed. The sort of use cases we're seeing is a lot of low latency use cases where people need you know rich data in the moment. Um, that doesn't mean you still won't have some data that moves at batch, especially where you want to group and you want to aggregate um, your data and you want to combine your data. You know those will also be interesting patterns as well as virtualizing your data as well. So you know not always collecting it all to the center and streaming it all. Um, as well as the other big trend we see in this is the citizen data and the citizen data integrator. So we, what we're seeing is we still need the expert en data engineers, but we also need to grow as part of that. And we need to give the data preparation, data wrangling tools um, to the business so they can actually go off and do some of that experimentation. And find the final pillar in our data foundation is really that agile data platform sitting at the heart of our architecture in the central here. Um, this is, um, you know, what we're seeing, um, you know, what we're doing is moving our center of gravity, which we'll talk more about in a minute, to the cloud. Um, that's really to unlock and un enable us to unify that data. Because what we're seeing is not only connectivity, but convergence. People want to be able to see across. I want to be able to see the customer's journey across these different connected devices, across these different channels, so I can, so we can respond better to their needs. Um, and, you know, and hence why the Agile data platform is important. Uh, and this needs to, you know, it needs to be able to cope with self-service. And the, one of the things about self-service is pretty unpredictable. So elastic capability is fundamental to that. So you can respond to those elastic demands uh, of the business. 
you know, as you democratize the querying of the data, the ability to do the analysis, you need to have an elastic platform sitting behind there that can respond to those needs. And then we've got the other, the other then is, is how do you grow? How do you grow the insight and analytics consumption on top of there? So here we've got um, three main strategies. I'll start at the top. One is promoting self-service. So this is really giving analysis freedom out across the business to your analysts and your um, to your analysts and your consumers, so that they can ask new and better questions around the data in the moment in those meetings. So moving away from stale curated data to you know which has been uh, polished you know for a week before you go to the meeting, actually being able to you know navigate and interrogate that in the meeting, so you can actually you know so people don't have to go away and find out what really happened. You know, and that enables a much better business conversation um, around what, what's actually happening in the business. Um, number two is we want to provide an app store. So in terms of these, these insight applications, we really want to be able to share and collaborate around that. So we think this connected, the connected world and the converging world, we want to be able to, so, you know, what's happening around mobile experience, what's happening around um, the, the, you know, the, um, um, on TV, uh, TV viewing. What's the what's the latest hot um, contents and programs and series? You know, the, these are uh, will be on an app store. It'll be shared now. Um, analytical content in the apps. This will be a mix of different types of content. So it could be a dashboard. It could be a report. Could be APIs. Could be algorithms. We really want to enable that app store that allows you to collaborate. That and people can like and they can promote. And you know, and you'll have um, you know. Um, you know, we want to create a social collaboration experience alongside. So this is actually complementing the data marketplace I talked about earlier, really. These are the insight applications that are based on top of that data marketplace. We see these as really two sides of the, uh, of the same coin. Uh, and finally, what we have there is the co cognitive services. You know, a very um, uh, fast changing area here, cognitive. You know, we call this cognitive um, because, you know, part of my responsibilities is around data and analytics. And I see AI as something that also touches um, um, on, uh, on digital. You know, so cognitive is really for me is the brain. You know, you're trying to um, 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 match or improve on um, human decision making, um, you know, so the brain. But you know, AI can also cover the other senses, so like your eyes, your hands, uh, your, your, your smell. Um, you know, robotics, all that sort of stuff. That's not a, that's not a core focus for me. Is I mean, one of the arch other architecture main. So I support that by providing the brains, uh, but not necessarily all, all of the part of it. So really, this is about the that machine learning, deep learning, data science capabilities, as well as decision management. So here we see um, a, a set of capabilities. We'll talk more about later. But what we see is an explosion in the opportunities to augment and automate. Um, a lot of these decisions. So, you know, as we move into this digital world, a lot more decisions need to be made in the moment. And, you know, it's just not possible for humans to do that in the moment. However, they are helping augment. They're, they're the ones who are in control of this cognitive services. So they're the ones who are setting the business rules through, um, through self-service decision management and also plugging in the, uh, the algorithms. So, you know, plugging in the algorithms and actually enabling that experimentation and that com competition between those algorithms as part of the, these frameworks. And roughly, you know, we've grown to over a million decisions um, a day today, um, automated and augmented decisions a day. And I see we see that growth grow, continue to grow out to five million and 50 million by 2025 as as this connectivity explosion continues and as um, we, uh, you know, 5G uh, and self-healing networks and uh, ultra-fast self-healing networks. There's a lot more automation and augmentation to come. Um, uh, okay, on to the next slide. So let's so let's dive, dive a bit deeper into that um, cloud, that agile data platform that we talked about. You know, so what what is that? What well, what we're trying to do here is really transform the speed of time to market, time to data, and time to insight. So we're trying to reduce that time it takes the business to get access to data and then that being able to produce insight from that data. Um, we're also trying to um, enable the business to experiment. And what we see today is, you know, an inordinate amount of time in the experimentation is really focused on, um, you know, finding the data and, and doing some of that data prep and data wrangling. 
we really want to focus, you know, so we want to make the data more easily available so they can focus more of their time on producing the insight, really, um, and also make it easier for people to experiment, you know, really, you know, back to that space filling idea and name experimentation across the organization, you know, and a common platform is fundamental to that, you know, having silos, uh, you know, having mobile over here, fixed over there, TV over there, you know, those are just barriers to, to providing that enterprise insight. Um, you know, so this center of gravity, also what we're, we're doing here is we're actually trying to uh, provide um, a common data platform. So um, what we saw in the previous generation was, you know, taking this, you know, your data warehouse, you know, complementary capabilities, your data warehouse providing you the curated consensus around the business, you know, your complex schema, complex SQL, um, and then your deep your deep data, your event data, and your big data lake. But what we ended up doing often in the business was they'd move the small data to the big data to augment it, to enrich the big data, or they were taking aggregated data from big data over to the data, plat uh, data warehouse to augment, to provide more signals around what was happening to the big data. You know, so bringing this into a common platform, um, you know, but recognizing it's a common platform doesn't mean it's the same storage technology. But you know that will bring it closer together. So common common capabilities here. So you still might have um, you know a columnar database to do your your data, you know, data warehousing, and you might have an object store to do your big data um, type analysis. But at least it's closer together, and there's less friction from having a common technical platform and services that you can provide in there. So common data fabric, for example, common data preparation tools. Um, and also what we see here, what, what we're really promoting is this data product idea. So what we want to do is, you know, again, that distribution, this space filling idea, we want to really break down and, and think about data as products. So we've got our, uh, you know, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, but, you know, fundamentally thinking about our data as a product and, you know, not think of it as, you know, in the big data schema on read container idea or the, uh, you know, uh, sort of data warehouse monolith, which has a single centralized team looking after it. We're trying to, you know, truly really distribute this, you know, means. But um, key thing to see about bringing it into, um, into the contact, you know, that's ML innovations happening at the moment. You can get access to the latest AI and ML, and it's moving at a pace. So, you know, um, you know, so that, you know, we see some real advantages in moving that closer to where all that innovation is happening. Um, anyway. Okay, so, so I touched on the product thinking, um, you know, so, and this is really, you know, leveraging those ideas that have come out of um, the retail world where, you know, how they, where they think deeply about how they manage their products, you know, and we're trying to apply that to um, data, uh, you know, and we're leveraging some of the work, you know, um, uh, 3D uh, and the data mesh architecture, you know, these, these are, you know, this is where we're getting the inspiration from for these ideas. Um, so, you know, source data products, you know, these are, you know, largely um, uh, mirrors of our source systems with, with some, um, um, uh, you know, where we've actually done some work to make it a bit easier to consume. You know, so we do do a bit of work. It's not a, an exact mirror. Um, we do do some work to, to align it with our um, enterprise data model just to make it a bit easier to consume. But these are roughly mapped one to one to our uh, master systems, our key um, operational systems. Um, and then what we do is we have on top of there the consumption data products, which are owned by the business. And those are really focused around a set of use cases. Um, you know, and again, it's about thinking about it's almost thinking about it like a, a serial box where you write on, you know, this this is what this this data product's gonna um, are gonna do. And we actually do some portfolio management to ensure that you know we understand how many um, boxes of cereal we have and how many boxes of uh, you know dairy products we have, and you know think of it as a store type idea. Um, you know, and the the really fundamental is thinking of data domain as a first cast concern is the um, you know, fundamentally to this is the standards, you know, the data standards that we apply. So we do, you know, uh, with being a product owner comes a lot of responsibility to quote uh, Spider-Man. Um, so, you know, you have to really, you know, what we have is we have a set of standards that in order for people, you know, so, you know, you have, um, 
data products go through a life cycle, so alpha, beta, generally available, and the standards they have to pass to be able to qualify for generally available data products. You know, uh, and that, you know, those are stuff like, you know, they have to be cataloged in our uh, data catalog. They have to be have a defined interface um, that they uh, provide to consumers. Um, uh, they have to um, ha have an owner, um, you know, um, a declared data owner who's responsible for that data product. Um, they have to set their um, um, SLAs, OLAs around what, what the uh, um, service levels are for that uh, data product, how fresh the data is, data quality checks um, um, alongside that data product. You know, and those are fundamental, because, you know, those are fundamental to enable you to join those, bring those data products together, which is, you know, that, that's where we see a lot of the value is, you know, when it's not about having data products. Data products should be able to provide uh, some value in its own right, but it's really combining those data products. There's also a lot of value in doing that as well. And, you know, and that's, you know that, that's the fundamental idea behind data warehousing, which we still want to leverage and use. Uh, so we also got a lot of trends in our, you know, about those insight services. You know, we tend to break those down into the, the three main um, uh, personas that we focus on. Um, but, you know, the fundamental idea here is, again, going back to that space filling idea that we really want to um, grow um, that triangle we have at the top there, grow the number of users and grow the number of users in each of these areas. So, you know, consumers, we can really see, you know, it's really about in expanding insight consumption across the organization. So how do we get more insight and spread it from that sea level out to the, the front lines? You know, and we're seeing, you know, a lot of innovation, you know, a lot more interactive capability. We're seeing a lot of um, capability um, to, to move insight across those different personas. So analysts can share more easily with um, consumers. Um, as well as data scientists can share across there, you know, that, you know that's important. Um, but also new interfaces, so, you know, interfaces like uh, search and conversational interfaces, um, you know, with uh, insight bots, for example, you know, that help our users different ways from to talk and um, get access to insight. Um, and then we've got our self service analysts. We're really trying to speed up, uh, enable them to speed up insight identification. So, you know, again, a lot of innovation we're seeing in, in the capabilities around that space, you know, with um, a, a broader range of visualization, a broader range of recommendations around that, natural language generation. So, you've got some words to go with the, the visuals you're seeing, so to, under, to help understand the picture you're seeing, um, as well as more collaborative capabilities, you know, really around. Um, you know, around those reports, so you can, it's much easier to share uh, and have a have a um, have a social collaboration with other users around that. And then finally, we've got our data scientists. You know, we're really looking to scale that out. So that's really from the citizen data scientists up to the expert data scientists. So you know, massive amounts of innovation in those area. Um, you know, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about this in the, in the next slide. So, you know, here um, where the other two sectors tend to be more mass market, so we're looking at more common tools in this area, then it tends to be much more a smaller community of much more experts. So we're, we're, we're being a, we've got more flexibility here around bring your own tools because there's not, you know, um, we want to unlock that, you know, that value uh, in this in this expert community. Um, where typically in the other two, it's much more about connecting and distributing the insight across the different communities. Um, uh, and also what I want to talk to you about is, well, you know, so, you know, AI and cognitive strategies, uh, um, you know, a, a big opportunity for, for, for every industry, to be honest. Um, uh, but, you know, we're thinking quite deeply about how, how do we approach um, AI strategy. Um, you know, AI is everywhere. You know, we, we, you know, I say, you know, there's not a, there's not a, a division or a unit that we can't benefit from smarter decision making. Um, and what we're thinking about is, you know, um, you know, where do you buy, where do you build your AI? Where is the differentiation? What is commodity uh, for your business and what is uh, differentiation for your business? Where do you want to own the learning? Where do you want to leverage learning from the rest of your rest of your industry or cross industries? You know, where, where uh, and where's the where's the you know, how do you balance the value versus that competitive differentiation? You know, and those, uh, and that affects your AI strategy, you know, because if you're thinking of talent analytics, maybe you buy that. But if you're, um, if you're a people, if you're a sports-based company, that's probably a differentiation for you. So maybe you want to build your AI around there because you, you know, it's your unique learning uh, and you want to own that learning. You don't want to, you know, uh, be given that earning, uh, learning out so they can be sold to other companies. 
Um, we're also seeing self-service. So those, you know, we need to grow. You know, we've got um, around 100 data scientists, uh, but that's, um, you know, that's less less than one percent of the organisation, 100,000 organisation. Um, but we want to actually spread some of that data. You know, data science, AI is a spectrum. You know, not everything's an expert or really complex. You know, there's big, hairy, gnarly um, AI data science problems. Well, that's where the, you know, those are the stuff we'll target are the experts. But there's other smaller and medium-sized problems that we, we're looking at tooling, where the tooling can help in those, in those citizen um, areas. Experimentation, you know, is fundamental, not just to the AI, but also to the analytics as well. But we're really looking at how do we industrialize that experimentation? How do we... Um, provide um, easy ramps from going from experimentation to production. Um, how do we allow ourselves to be able to go in there and actually um, test out new AI? You know, what what one thing I'm confident of is over the next five years there'll be a huge amount more innovation. You know, so being able to adapt and bring on new algorithms and new capabilities is going to be important. So you know, those those are some of the fundamentals. But also, we want to enable the, you know the experimentation. So being able to share what experiments we've had, whether they're successful or not, so that actually, you know, if you're going to be a, a learning organization, then that information, that, that knowledge needs to be systematized so that everyone has access to it, you know. So if I do an experiment, other people can know if my experiment was, you know, and actually learn from me not, and not have to learn it themselves. Um, ethics and responsibility is clearly important. You know, we're thinking deeply about that. Um, you know, we're looking at how, you know, you know, there's a lot of work going on around what some of the ethics policies, as well as, um, um, you know, some of the tooling, how tooling can help. So how can you de-bias your data? How can you make sure your um, the outcomes are, are responsible, um, are transparent? Um, you know, so some interesting things happening in there, and that's a key, another key pillar, um, as well as then, you know, the broader society. So how do we use this connected world to actually benefit the whole of society? Um, uh, and how do we actually use it as well as part of convergence? So, you know, how do we connect it with these other technologies that are uh, um, exponential technologies that are coming on that can really make a difference to society? So th let's bring it all back together now. I've, I've, I've talked across a number of those topics. Um, I thought I'd throw some use cases at you just to give you some examples. So one of them where we've had some great success is uh, nuisance calls. Um, you know, virtually everyone gets nuisance calls these days. You know, 75% of our customers receive um, at least one and, and probably more than one a nuisance call per month. Um, and what we've done is taken over 2 billion records and used that to develop algorithms um, that will allow us to filter out those calls and, and take away those nuisance calls away. Now, these are unknown, you know, unknown um, callers uh, to our customers. If it's a, um, a friend or family, we've got another product that takes care of those type of nuisance calls. Uh, but this is really those mass mass caller type um, scenarios where they're calling lots of people. Now, this is an adversarial AI, so we've created this compound index, but we have to continue to evolve that. Because what we find is, like fraud, this is where someone, you know, you, you, you come up with a defensive algorithm, someone else tries to find a new way to get around your algorithm. So you've got to keep um, constantly evolving your algorithm to, to keep making sure that, that your net is capturing as many of these as possible. Um, we're also looking at techniques to actually um, discourage people from doing that as well. So, you know, there's, um, uh, so for example, we, we always terminate the call. Um, so we make sure we charge the offender, uh, which is a, quite a clever technique, but we don't terminate it with our customers. So that's a, a useful, you know, other things to think about as well as just the analytics. And so the, actually what you do with that analytics is really important to drive the right behavior back to the front line. Um, also, we've been using it to understand uh, you know, our cloud idea to, to actually understand customer service. So uh, in our mobile, better understand our customers by bringing the different data together, both our online and our offline data. So really unifying that data so we can understand better our customers, uh, understand how they're um, interacting with us across the different channels, which channels do they want to be contacted on, when do they want to be contacted, um, and really also what the the cloud allows us to do is we can elastically expand that. We can test five times quicker at that five times quicker, and we can also test it a lot cheaper. Um, and we can get also a better result, you know, and, um, by testing different algorithms, more permutations. You know, and what that means is that you know we we can do more. 
we can do more and we can get a better result. We can get more and we can do it at a lower cost. You know, so we've had some fantastic results from actually doing that, bringing our data together and really understanding how do we make sure we've got relevant marketing out to our uh, um, customers. So, you know, what, what, what are some takeaways really from building this? Well, I'd, I'd you know, think about how you're going to scale this. This is the, one of the big challenges for organizations where you've got so much wealth of data coming towards you. You know, one is, you know, we need to treat it as a, a core foundation data in your organization. That's a fundamental. You know, it can't be something that, that's, um, uh, that, that's done on the side or an output at your organization. It needs to be fundamentally thought about alongside your people, um, your data and your core services. You need to really think about that data. Um, you know, the other key one is rethinking, you know, human-centered approach. You know, how do we enable it? You know, how do you enable that insight-driven mindset for our customers and our colleagues? You know, it can't, you know, so how do we, and how do we spread that across the whole organization? You know, you know that space-filling idea is fundamental to me, you know, in terms of democratizing across, you know, um, and, and that really requires not only invest in the architecture and your strategy, but also your people. Um, and that's both, you know, your colleagues, your customers, and your partners. You know, that, and that's, that's a fundamental shift I see that's going to have to happen. Um, and then finally, the other big idea I'd, I'd promote is actually thinking about, you know, that, that terminal endpoint idea again, you know, so thinking about how do you actually enable some common services, modular common services at that, because you need that flexibility. There's a lot of changes coming. You need to be able to swap this out and try out new stuff. But those modular common services, does that enable you to actually to, to spread that out? You know, if everyone had different electrical sockets or we all had different capillaries, then it, you know, we, we would not be as successful today um, it, with our great cities or, uh, you know, the, uh, in the animal kingdom if we'd have gone with different, different types of fittings here. You know, so, that, you know, those are fundamental ideas I think we can take from, um, you know, from, from nature and from, um, you know, other, other, other industries, you know, where, where that stuff's really worked. Um, and, and probably finally, obviously, the, the self-optimized. So think about how you experiment and how you test and learn with these ideas to see what's working and, and where you can um, really, you know, automate that and build that into your code. You know, so we have a dashboard that shows me the architecture health of our ecosystem. So I'm learning about what is working, what's being used, where they're finding value and where, and where there's friction in our system. So we can continue to evolve our architecture. So it's really delivering what both our colleagues and our customers want. Well, well thank you for listening to me today. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. We'll now move on to Q and A. Thank you. All right. Just as a reminder, uh, though the speaker is unable to attend, please do feel to submit questions in the Q and A window to the right of the screen, and they will be reviewed at a later time. Thank you. And it looks like that completes the uh, this session. Thank you, Jason, for this great presentation, and thanks to our attendees for tuning in. Please complete the EDW conference session survey. They're located at the bottom of this page. Uh, the next session will start in a few minutes. Thank you.